in through stressful events and maybe in the deathful events. So we decide with this system of activity, the orthosympathetic activity, which means adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, to destroy our source of energy. As soon as we have expired all this energy, we need to recover. So uh, people with chronic pain, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder and depression have low levels of GABA because they have uh, expired all this energy. Now they need to shift in a different perception and physiological reactions. So we have to use yoga to switch to the parasympathetic. So during meditation, we can increase the acetylcholine, the dopamine, which are very important neurotransmitter to restore the activity. And one of the top characteristic in um, yoga practice, and you can find just in one hour of practicing of yoga, a, bet, a better connection in the different cortical frontal region. So in the brain, specifically in the prefrontal uh, cortex. And uh, this can give us um, the big opportunity to shift to better condition to recover after the, the stress, after the competing goals. All our life is a kind of escaping from the Leo, which is trying to catch us. Think about the COVID-19 that uh, pushed a lot of people in a, so, in a sort of jail, an home jail. In this situation, we have suffered a lot because there was a, a neurological perspective of constriction. And yoga can help us to switch to the parasympathetic activity. So the true menacing of fear can immediately tune us on adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. As far as we decide to come back to normality, we need to recover our energy through the meditation, through the yoga. So uh, yoga is very important because um, it helps us to connect the different places of the um, basal ganglion, like the putamen, like the nucleus caudatus, to the prefrontal brain that will help us during the execution of different movements, perfectly tuned to switch off the brain. So we need to make connections. As far as we are able to create better connection of different side of the brain, in that moment, we increase the level of acetylcholine, of dopamine, which are all rewarding neurotransmitters. So we, the evolution of humanity is depending upon the capacity to create better adaptation to the new physiology. So the body is able to produce a lot of gratification and this will help us to increase the neuroplasticity. So the simple creation of different patterns between different sides of the brain and different neurotransmitters will help us to become no more uh, the gazelle trying to escape and to survive to the Leo catch, but the moment of relaxation, the quiet after the storm. So the brain can make the, the difference. The, main, the brain, as um, Osho, uh, Osho Ranesh stated, is a big liar. So whenever we listen to the brain, the brain can make confusion, can make alarm. It is its job. So we have to disconnect this through a neurological perspective, uh, releasing the fight and fly physiology and switching to the parasympathetic. So fear means orthosympathetic reaction. Yoga means the mindful um, relaxation, calm state of the mind. So we switch off the brain and the mind can expand like oil horizontally expanding everywhere. So we can change our behaviors and our habits. Of course, this is depending also a kind of self-transformation um, and to make them a little easier, we have to follow some basic principle as to follow the proper diet. So serving is very important. Every single <clears throat> religion which take care about uh, um, the nutrition, the serving, you can find in the Israeli principle, in the Catholic, in the Hinduism, in the Tibetan religion. So we better uh, follow the concept of to reduce the amount of, of food. So we have to reorganize the control of goal directed through the behavior. 
So the best behavior we can achieve is um, an executive functioning of the brain. So the brain is good when we have to survive for the fast and fly, fight and fly. But we cannot always run so hardly. We have to recover. So we need time. We need to recover with the meditation, with the yoga. So we better switch on the different way of mental health. Mental health means retreats. It means also effective strategies and effective strategy that can help protect and restore the mental health through, uh, you know, yoga practicing can become much more accepted and practiced to support mental health and disorder because you can change different changing in the blood patterns also before and after the practice of yoga. GABA, the neurotransmitter which has an inhibitory capacity, will be increased after one hour of yoga. This is amazing because your immune system will be pumped by the GABA. So we have to release, we have to increase the capacity to switch to the parasympathetic activity. We cannot fight 24 hours a day. And sometimes we are we act like a, a, a gazelle and we are running to survive 24 hours a day. So meditation, yoga, good nutrition will help us to reconnect um, the different side of the brain through the simple practicing of asanas, which is very important just to increase the balance of neurotransmitters. So we cannot find, we cannot survive only fighting 24 hours a day. We have to, to improve our immune system, practicing the right principle of meditation. And this is what uh, Patanjali described in the first line of the Yoga Sutras. So the purpose of yoga is to still the turbulence of the mind. So the, the mind, the brain is a liar. So we have to switch off the brain and to find the different pattern between the different activation of the brain. We have to switch off the remote control of our television if we don't want to listen to the noise and we have to get inside. So COVID-19 has been a, a good good uh, um, opportunity for us to get, to get inside, to find our dark side of our moon, expanding the light within, without looking always outside. The light is inside, inside us. So yoga means to switch on the light and to switch off the brain. The brain is a liar. The yoga can increase the GABA activity, can increase the parasympathetic activity, can allow us to work in a better energy pattern. You know, the simple uh, phone, when you are low in battery, they will uh, play a different utilization of energy. So low battery execution means then sometimes we have to manage with different levels of energy. We cannot spend more than what we have in, in the bank account. So we have to take particular care investigating about um, yoga can affect individuals with mental health condition. So for us, it's better than any other drugs. So you have to quiet the mind. So we have to recover Thank this. Thank you, structure. Mr. Panfili. Sorry to interrupt you. We have to close. <laughs> it was okay. amazing addressing, very, very interesting, and giving us such an overview of how we are working inside and how yoga can help us. So thank you for being with us. You're welcome. And yeah, I would like to invite uh, and warmly welcome Miss. Uh, Adrim Altenaiji, who is the founder of Kinsuji Space from Abu Dhabi. Ms. Adrim, I would love that you can address us waiting for your words. Your mic is not working. You have opened your mic. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here to learn more about yoga and be able to meditate and share this precious time with all of you. We all know meditation gathers power when we do it all together. So I would like to thank the organization and Gurudev for creating this conscious space 
to help all of us thrive in this challenging time and also to strengthen our mental resilience. Uh, recently in my magazine, Pensugi, I wrote an article about this golden time where I explored why this is the perfect moment and chance to ask ourselves bigger questions and move into consciousness and meaning and to take this challenge and opportunity to heal ourselves and repair. And I believe today with all the speakers, they were mentioning a tools for all of us to use it during this pandemic to heal ourselves and repair by the meditation, by the yoga. And for me personally, I focused during this time into the way I breathe, where I start to study different breathing practices. And it's a huge change, one small change, but it affect me in a big scale. It's so simple and we take it for granted, our breathing, you know? So during this pause, I've been thinking a lot about a caterpillar and how it goes into its own cocoon in order to grow and change into beautiful butterfly. And I believe creating this festival today, it will help us to shift and transform through this virtual cocoon. So thank you, Gurudev, and thank you for all the organization and the speakers for helping us to understand more the power of meditation, the power of yoga. And I hope all the best for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Miss uh, Aldrin, for your blessings and for your beautiful addressing. Very grateful. Thank you. And it's my pleasure now to reach for our last uh, keynote uh, speaker, uh, Professor Fari Sachoglu, who is Professor of the Department of Biosciences uh, at University Oslo in Norway. So Fari, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. It's a great uh, honor and privilege uh, for me. What a wonderful and very timely event. Uh, in fact, what I had in mind to share with you, the speakers before me have already shared in different ways, starting with Gurudev, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, um, the Honorable uh, uh, Gayatri Ji, uh, Kamdesh Ji, and of course, uh, Professor Panfili. Uh, nevertheless, I will uh, share with you some perspectives from my experience as a yoga practitioner, which I started uh, early in college and as a scientist. Having observed uh, very uh, positive effects on myself and the others, then I followed the science on yogic practices over the years. So I'd like to uh, share with you some slides and some perspectives uh, about uh, that. Can you see my slides? Yes, Fadi. Okay. So I'd like to start with uh, asking you a simple question. What are the components of wellness? So please take a moment and think in your mind, what is it that makes us feel well and healthy? Of course, you're thinking about the body, uh, our emotions. Um, there are several pieces that need to be in place for us to feel well. And all of these are important and influence each other. Um, we need to keep in mind that well-being is not only perception and expectation of physical uh, well-being, uh, but also being intellectually stimulated by an optimal level of intellectual activity, to have a positive sense of self-regard and deal with unpleasant um, uh, mood states, to have a perception of being connected well with family and coworkers, so very important uh, during the pandemic, um, 
and having a positive perception of the environment where we work and also have a positive perception of meaning and purpose in life, the spiritual aspect. And these are all interconnected and there's one aspect that can uh, break down uh, every part and the connection between these parts and that is uh, chronic stress. Um, as uh, was described uh, so well by uh, Professor Panfili, um, stress actually is important for us to survive and perform uh, in the short term, but if it's long term, then it starts to break our system. Despite this importance of stress, uh, we don't give enough place for it in uh, our uh, healthcare system. Um, I've given uh, some presentations at the WHO um, and each time I go, I look at their website of health topics. Um, and um, as you can see here, stress is not one of the topics, even though it's estimated that 75 to 90 percent of doctors office visits are stress related. It's the same. Uh, in the health topics of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There is uh, an entry on occupational stress, but uh, that's it. Uh, so the situation is this, two uh, medical professionals are talking to each other. Uh, one is saying, according to the latest research, the average human body is 20% water and 80% stress. So we have to do something about stress. Uh, this has been recognized by the field of psychoneuroimmunology which posits that chronic stress, negative emotions, and individual characteristics directly affect the bi-directional interactions between the nervous system, endocrine system, and the immune system. Um, and if we cannot deal with the negative input to this P and I axis, the immune system breaks down, and of course, disease arises. However, if we are able to handle the stress, we have positive emotions and individual characteristics, PNI access is supported and then wellness uh, arises. We actually know a lot about how this works. We know that chronic stress uh, suppresses the immune system, disturbs our digestive system, increases heart rate, blood pressure, etc. In addition, it instigates bad coping strategies such as smoking and drinking and all of the, these increase the risk of uh, disease. And um, uh, we know a lot about the molecular mechanisms of this. Uh, I will not go uh, into this. There's really a great body of knowledge on this. But I wanted to uh, share with you uh, a landmark study which was published uh, in 1991, uh, looking at about 400 subjects. I think all of us uh, experience that when we are stressed, we are most likely to catch colds then. I think this is our common experience. This was shown um, uh, very directly in this study where um, the subjects were infected directly with different cold viruses. And as you can see here, uh, when the psychological stress, stress index is high, then the subjects uh, coming down with colds increased significantly. There's basically a direct correlation. And this was true for all different types of um, cold viruses. And you can see uh, a cousin of the SARS-CoV-2 that is wreaking havoc in our world now, coronavirus, uh, was uh, one of them. Um, but since I'm a cancer biologist, I also brought uh, an example from cancer biology to show the importance of environmental influences on our health and wellness, not only in terms of simple colds, but also in chronic diseases. So in cancer research, we use uh, mice as model systems and we uh, house them either in normal cages as shown on the left, um, or in this study in enriched cages, as you can see, they're larger, um, uh, they have a lot of toys, they're much more colorful, it's enabling the mice to socialize more, etc. So uh, the authors of this study um, 
uh, hypothesize that if we change the environment uh, of the mice, uh, then it can have an effect on cancer uh, development. So they placed genetically identical mice, either in normal cages or enriched cages, and gave them the same food, same water, and then they injected them with human uh, tumor cells, which grew into uh, tumors. And what they found was very striking. When the mice grew in uh, control cages, the um, tumors grow to a certain size, large tumors. When they were in the enriched environment cages, the tumors were decreased by 80%. So they ate exactly the same thing. They're genetically identical, but their environment made a major um, influence uh, on the outcome. Uh, so this was for melanoma, but, uh, which is one of the uh, most aggressive uh, tumors, but it was done for other um, uh, cancers as well. Here is shown for pancreatic cancer, another very um, aggressive tumor. And this is not only for mice. Uh, there have been experiments uh, showing the effect of lifestyle changes uh, on uh, cancer development. Uh, here are a couple of uh, these studies on prostate cancer showing that um, intensive nutrition and lifestyle intervention can have major effects on the outcome of uh, the disease. Of course, this is not new. Uh, this is uh, ancient knowledge that our environment, uh, the uh, aspect of uh, our wellness, the wellness wheel affects us in a major way. So uh, this is a quote from the ancient epic Mahabharata from uh, India, where it says, there are two classes of diseases, bodily and mental. Each arises from the other and neither can exist without the other. Thus mental disorders arise from physical ones and likewise physical disorders arise from mental ones. In fact, if we look at the very foundation of uh, modern medicine, uh, Hippocrates uh, is considered to be the father of modern medicine. He said, I would rather know the person who has the disease rather than the disease the person has. This is basically a description of personalized medicine, uh, which we've uh, come to uh, uh, understand the importance of and appreciate in the last uh, uh, couple of uh, decades. So there's no question we have to handle chronic stress. So how to do that? Uh, there are many different uh, ways we can approach it. Stress management skills are there, time management, diet is important, exercise, etc. I would like to suggest that based on the uh, published research, the ancient tools, uh, yogic practices, breathwork, meditation are the most effective. And there are a lot of studies done uh, on uh, these practices. I did a search uh, in the databases uh, with the keyword yoga, uh, which showed that there are about 5,500 studies, uh, research studies in international journals. I did another search with meditation. There are about 7,000 uh, studies. As you can see uh, here, the, the research is greatly increasing in the last uh, two uh, decades or so. So there's a um, great uh, interest because these practices are effective. Uh, here's a summary uh, on the research uh, on yogic practices uh, from a uh, National Institute of Health uh, website. There uh, is increased energy and vitality, increased optimism, uh, decreased anxiety, reduced blood pressure, uh, decreased pain, um, amelioration of various diseases, improved social interactions, and uh, so forth. So it basically um, uh, shows, the research uh, shows that yogic practices affect all aspects of uh, the wellness uh, wheel, which is shown here. So if you come back to uh, our wellness wheel, for example, for the physical, there's there are distinct physiological effects, uh, uh, normalization of the cortisol level, um, the uh, distinct EEG changes, immune cells uh, uh, um, changes uh, that are uh, beneficial, uh, decreases in chronic disease, uh, reduced uh, inflammation and so forth. 
In terms of emotional aspect, there's increased optimism, decreased stress, anxiety, depression, mental strength, increase in resilience and emotional intelligence uh, and so forth. So uh, yogic practice uh, really uh, has uh, been shown by research that has the potential to fulfill all aspect of the um, wellness wheel. Now, how does this work? How do all of these uh, very different effects uh, uh, come about? Uh, we can understand this in the context of a paradigm shift in uh, science that we've been experiencing. One is neuroplasticity uh, that was referred to uh, before by Dr. Panfili. Um, and the second is epigenetics. So I will describe these very briefly for you. So neuroplasticity basically means that brain remains changeable even into late adulthood. When I went to medical school, the uh, physiology textbook said that the brain develops during a critical period in early childhood, adolescence, then remains relatively unchangeable. In fact, it goes down. So a, many of the research studies on neuroplasticity, in fact, come from meditation research. Um, it was documented uh, over many decades that during meditation, there are distinct changes to the activity of the brain. So here shown from one study, um, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, graph on the left side, you can see exactly where the meditation began with the increase in the activity of um, these um, measurements. And compared to control, meditators have significantly increased activity in certain uh, parts of the brain. This suggested that the change in activity may give rise to changes in the very structure of the brain. And in fact, this was what was found first reported in 2005 by researchers at Mass General Hospital, Yale University and Harvard uh, um, Medical School. What they found when they compared non-meditating subjects with those who have been meditating for some years is that in certain areas, that are shown um, by these uh, color-coded uh, images, so these red uh, areas, um, were found to be increased in uh, meditators compared to controls. And this was uh, replicated many times over. Uh, I think there are about 25 different studies now uh, documenting similar effects of uh, meditation. Uh, a more, uh, a recent study showed that as short as eight weeks of uh, meditation can uh, induce these effects. Uh, some of the uh, findings are shown here. Red is the meditators, uh, blue um, are non-meditators, uh, the change that occurs during uh, eight weeks. As you can see in a number of different areas, uh, there are increases in the very um, uh, structure of the brain. And it turns out that these uh, areas are not haphazard. They are areas that are associated with beneficial uh, effects. For example, uh, they are involved in attention, introspection, sensory processing, uh, also learning and memory, emotional regulation, uh, perspective taking, uh, differences, uh, luckily, uh, for those uh, uh, who may feel they are getting older, were most pronounced in older participants. That means when you do these practices, you get more effects um, in these um, areas. So the second area is close to my heart, epigenetics, because this is uh, the area of cancer research that I'm involved in. It basically means that in addition to the DNA sequence of an organism, there are environmental effects uh, that can switch the genes on and off, thus affect how cells uh, function. So to explain that um, uh, better, I'll give you a, a crash course on Bio 101. This is a picture of a, a cell, a cross-section. There are beautiful structures in it. 
different organelles such as the mitochondria, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. In the middle, there is the DNA. We all know about the DNA, which is the um, uh, blueprint of our physiology. It, it um, has these packets of information called genes and the flow of information is from DNA to RNA to protein. And this is called gene expression. So now I'll ask you um, a question uh, to be on the same uh, page. Um, I think most people will recognize this person to the left. He is uh, Lionel Messi, and this is um, Mr. Chimpanzee. So I would like to ask you how much difference is there between the DNA of a human being, Messi, and that of a monkey? So give you five seconds. Is it one to two percent, ten percent, twenty percent, or fifty percent? Yes, the answer is one to two percent. It's quite humbling, but uh, we are ninety-nine, ninety-eight percent identical to uh, uh, a chimpanzee. Now, I think a lot of you would also know this uh, person, uh, Roger Federer. I think greatest tennis player ever. Uh, so what is the difference between the DNAs of Messi and Federer? Again, five seconds. Is it 10%, 5%? Sorry, I, I only can agree. I only can agree. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Christoph, uh, we are uh, common fans of Roger. He's so great. Um, so what do you think? 10%, 5%, 1%, 0.1%? The correct answer is 0.1%. In fact, if you think of any person um, that you, you know, we are 99.9% .9 identical. In fact, at the level of the DNA structure, the very sequence, the old Indian dictum of Vasudev Kutumbakam is a reality. We are really a worldwide family. But if you look at the cells from one single person, um, nerve cells, liver cells, heart muscle cells, lymphocytes, they are very different in structure and function, but they have the same DNA. Why? It's because there are differences in gene expression. So based on this epigenetic knowledge, some uh, years ago, we uh, hypothesized that these beneficial effects that are observed with yogic practices, in this particular case, the SKY program that is uh, taught by the uh, International Art of Living Foundation, including um, uh, simple yoga asanas, um, powerful breathing exercises, uh, in particular the uh, Sudarshan Kriya program, the SKY program. We asked whether SKY may uh, induce effects in short term in participants at the level of their gene expression at the epigenetic level. So what we did was um, we took a group of people, they either practice the sky program or they went the same subjects on a nature walk, listen to relaxing music. And before and after we took blood and then in the immune cells in the blood, we analyzed the um, changes in gene expression. And this is what we found. I will not describe the technicalities of it, um, but basically every row uh, is uh, corresponding to a gene and every uh, column uh, is a subject. Uh, with the SKY program, there were significant changes in gene expression compared with the control regimen. In fact, there were about fourfold more changes uh, in gene expression, epigenetic changes, uh, by sky compared with uh, control regimen. Um, uh, we this was analyzed uh, further and we know what these genes are. There are some um, uh, uh, interactions uh, between these, which is uh, uh, for uh, further uh, study. So in summary, uh, there are distinct effects of yogic practices at the molecular level. Uh, and uh, these are likely to be in other cell types in the physiology and they happen within two hours. It's almost instantaneous. I think those of us who uh, practice yoga, uh, um, the effect of yoga is immediate. The, the uh, mindset, the feeling we have when we go into the yoga session, when we come out 
is uh, very different. And this happens all the way down to uh, the effects at the uh, epigenetic level. Of course, further studies are needed. And to summarize overall, for sustainable health and wellness, including mental health, but as we saw, it is uh, linked to everything else uh, we experience as individuals. One needs to consider all aspects of the individual. And the basis of doing so is to support the psychoneuroimmunology axis, engaging the epigenetic level and neuroplasticity. And based on the research that's available, uh, among the different tools to, to achieve this, I believe yogic practices are arguably the most powerful uh, tool. So I'd like to finish uh, with this cartoon. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bruce, he is a medical doctor. So this person is trying to uh, mop up the floor of the water that is uh, overflowing from a sink uh, because the faucet is open. I think uh, we, uh, in our um, Western approach to health, and uh, in fact, in uh, uh, personal uh, considerations, often find ourselves in uh, this uh, kind of uh, state. We are treating the symptom or trying to treat the symptom because you can do only so much. Here, luckily, uh, a, a friend comes and he has an idea. We and need to wind up, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm up. finishing. So he closes the faucet and uh, then uh, of course, this is uh, curing the root cause. And this is, um, in fact, what uh, uh, Kamleshi was uh, um, mentioning, the principle of heyam dukam anagatam in yoga. Uh, so Thank you, Fariji. <laughs> I have to stop you here. We have I'm so many I things to come. <laughs> show the picture from Norway. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your being with us, for all the interesting sharings. And uh, we are going to close this first uh, opening session. And I thank <clears throat> warmly all the panelists here. <clears throat> and I want to remind you all again about uh, our next uh, uh, workshop with Kamalesh Barval. And uh, it's going to be on 17, 20 June. And you want maybe play the lottery and win one of 10 free tickets. So please just scan the QR code and uh, good luck. So for now we are moving to the next session, which is a practice session. So we are putting in practice, practice everything. Uh, you can stay on this channel or you can go to the website uh, and choose your own workshop if you have not done. I invite all of you panelists to join us and to really experience the benefits of yoga. And again, a warm, well, a warm uh, thanks to all of you. Have a beautiful Bea, day. Um, Namaste. Bea, Bea, thank you so much um, uh, for the moderation. I would like to also, on behalf of the school, thank all of the, the great speakers. It, it, it's, it's wonderful to, to have you with us. And I think you, you, you really set the tone uh, for us to now dive into the practice. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And thank you, all of you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. All the best to all of you. Thank you.